Good, good morning. Uh, I'm Tim O'Shea, the Principal and Vice-Chancellor of the University, and a, a great pleasure to give you uh, the warmest possible welcome on this happy day, and this very happy week. Um, as you know, we're all here to congratulate and honour Emeritus Professor Peter Higgs, who, as you very well know, uh, to the university's enormous delight, has been awarded a Nobel Prize for Physics. Uh, before we get on to the press conference proper, I just want to say a few words about how the university will honour the legacy of Peter Higgs as we build on the university's investment last year and launch, launch a fundraising campaign for the second phase of the Higgs Centre for Theoretical Physics. Our plans centre on a new building that creates a unique environment to bring the brightest students from around the world together with academics, international researchers and innovators from industry to develop and apply new mathematical and computational approaches to solving the complex challenges we face. I'm extremely pleased to announce this morning that the Scottish Government has committed to helping us achieve this. Cabinet Secretary for Education Mike Russell has shown a huge commitment to the university and its research and has offered warm congratulations to Peter Higgs and the university, not just on the Nobel Prize, but also on the plans to create a lasting legacy. He talked to me yesterday and confirmed that the Scottish Government will make a contribution to the Higgs Centre and he's asked his officials to start discussion with the university about the way the contribution can be most effectively utilised. And this will allow us to support a new generation of Higgses um, to do world quality research and discoveries. I also this morning had a very happy conversation with David Willits, the UK Minister for Universities and Science. He again has already at Westminster given the warmest congratulations to Peter and he has invited the University of Edinburgh to bid to the UK Science and Technology Facilities Council uh, for support for this centre. In addition, we are getting a lot of private support and I particularly want to mention uh, Professor Walter Nimmo who has pledged £100,000 of his own personal money to the Higgs Centre. So we have got tremendous support for Peter's legacy and I'm aware that you haven't come to listen to me, uh, so I will now pass over to Vice Principal Richard Kenway, who will chair the press conference. Good morning, everybody. Uh, first of all, some housekeeping. Uh, we will end this press conference sharp at midday. Uh, at that point, uh, there will be five or ten minutes in which you can take photographs of Peter uh, in perhaps a different setting in the room here. Uh, but we are not going to permit any one-to-one -one interviews with Peter uh, today. Uh, and lastly, uh, because this is being streamed on the internet, please, uh, when you ask a question, uh, can you make sure you have a mic and there should be people with mics standing around uh, for you. So, my role, position in the university is the uh, Tate Professor of Mathematical Physics and I wanted to exploit this moment uh, on behalf of all of my colleagues in physics here in the university and around the world uh, to publicly congratulate Peter on the award of the 2013 Nobel Prize in Physics. <laughs> of course, uh, the prize for a theory can only be awarded by the Royal Academy of the, uh, the Swedish Royal Academy of Sciences uh, if that theory is confirmed by experiment. Uh, and as you well know, uh, we were here just about 15 months ago celebrating the discovery of the Higgs boson by the ATLAS and CMS experiments. And uh, we have Victoria Martin here on the panel from the ATLAS experiment. Uh, she's a reader here in the university and uh, had the great good fortune uh, to be taught physics by Peter. Uh, on my right, uh, Alan Walker uh, is a long-standing colleague and friend of Peter's uh, and has shared the rather eventful journey that Peter has had uh, since the 4th of July last year. But coming back, uh, 
to today, we are celebrating uh, the award of a prize for a theory uh, that Peter originated uh, almost 50 years ago. For theoretical physicists like myself, uh, it has become so integral to the way we've built up our mathematical explanation of the way that the universe works that it has long been hard to conceive that it could not be the way that nature actually does things. And we've all been, uh, as theoretical physicists, uh, held uh, by nature in this long wait uh, for the discovery of the Higgs boson. And now I think that's why uh, theoretical physicists around the world uh, have been celebrating with Peter this week, uh, in a sense, uh, the final uh, happy phase of that very long saga. So having said those words, uh, I'm going to open up uh, to you uh, and invite you to ask questions of Peter or the rest of us, if you so wish. So this. We don't have sound. Mm -hmm. Hello, this is Seventh from The Guardian. Um, hi, Peter. We know that in 2008, when CERN began researching for the Higgs boson, that you were in your kitchen, not, well, not aware that they'd started work. Can you tell us where you were on Tuesday when the announcement was finally made? You had where was I on Tuesday? <laughs> <laughs> on, on Tuesday, at the time of the announcement, I, I was down in, in Leith. Uh, for, for, for lunch. It, it, I'd originally intended to be rather further away in the West Highlands, but the, that plan didn't come to uh, anything, and I, I, I simply got out of the way for, for a short period in the middle of Tuesday while the telephone messages mounted up. <laughs> Another question? Yeah. There. How did you actually hear the news, though? Because we understand you don't have a mobile phone. Did uh, somebody tell you, in, in wherever you were at least, or how did you actually hear? How, how did you hear the news? Uh, well, well, curiously enough, I, I, I heard the news when I was returning from my lunch in Leith uh, later in the afternoon, uh, and uh, I was walking along Heriot Row when a car pulled up across the road. Uh, near the railings, uh, a lady in her 60s or maybe 70 or so got out and introduced herself as a former neighbour and widow of a, of a judge who died recently uh, and, and congratulated me on the news. And I said, oh, what news? <laughs> <laughs> And uh, so she told me that her daughter had phoned from London to alert her to the fact that uh, I, I had got this prize. And uh, I, I heard more about it, obviously, when I got home and started reading the messages. <laughs> how do you feel about winning the prize? Uh, how do I feel? Well, well, I'm obviously delighted and rather relieved that, in a sense, it's, it's all over because it's been a, a long time of coming. Um, maybe I should mention that as long ago as 1980, uh, an old friend who uh, happened to work in Sweden visited at Edinburgh and told me that from a colleague of his in physics, he'd learned that I'd been nominated for the prize so I was already then, in 1980, alerted to the possibility. Uh, in terms of later events, it, it, well, it seemed to me that uh, uh, for many years that, that the experimental verification might not come in my lifetime, but since the uh, start-up of the LHC, it's been pretty clear that they they, they would get there, and uh, despite some mishaps, they did get there. So uh, after July last year, uh, it seemed to be just a question of, of which year. Uh, last year would, was, would have been premature, 
because the announcement from CERN in July last year simply said they had found a Higgs-like particle. In the spring of this year, they firmed that up and called it a Higgs particle. So then it, it was really tied up experimentally uh, and I, I think the, at that stage the, the, uh, the prize was probably on its way. Next question, there's one here. <coughs> yeah. Okay, could you either perhaps move out to the side please, the, the photographers? Hi, Michael Glackin from The Times. Uh, you've mentioned, uh, Professor Higgs, that uh, you're obviously delighted at, at, at getting the prize. Did you celebrate in any specific way when you heard the news? Or have you celebrated yet? The celebration? Have you celebrated well, yet? Well, um, um, uh, uh, there was a, a celebration uh, of a group of us uh, uh, last night after the lecture by Frank Close. That was a, 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 certainly a, a, a start. And uh, I... Uh, shall be celebrating with my family with the help of a bottle or two of, of, of champagne early, early this evening. Uh, it hasn't been possible to get us all together before that. I, I should say that when we came back from CERN last year, Peter refused to have some Prosecco on the plane and he had a can of London Pride instead. So before this evening, Peter. <laughs> uh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Let me add, we are not being sponsored by <laughs> no, Pride, no, although we might be prepared to uh, discuss <laughs> sponsorship with them. Uh, so the next question, please, I think the lady there. Um, Rebecca McCullen from The Herald. I'm just wondering, um, you, the Prize has obviously catapulted you to a new level of fame. How do you feel about having that level of international recognition? You have been catapulted to a new level of fame. How do you feel about your new uh, celebrity status? Uh, well, well I, 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 I think I face the immediate future with some foreboding because uh, having experienced the wave of attention which followed the announcement at, at uh, CERN in July uh, 2012, I uh, anticipated that this last announcement would trigger, uh, well, an order of magnitude more attention. So I, I, I think I'm, I'm going to have difficulty in the next few months uh, having any of my life to myself. So, um, the lady at the back, yes. Uh, hello, my name is Guo Chengji from China Xinhua News Agency. Um, uh, my question is, when you heard the news of winning the prize, does it make you have a bigger appetite uh, while you are having your lunch? <laughs> this. And another question is, as the CERN confirmed the existence of the Higgins boson, do you think CERN should also win the prize? Thank you. Okay. The, the two parts. So the first question is uh, whether you uh, had an increased appetite when you heard the news, but I think the, I think the point was that Peter didn't hear the news until after he had had lunch. <laughs> yes. uh, so it might have aided his digestion, but no. it didn't aid his appetite. Uh, but the, the specific question is whether you think CERN uh, should uh, receive a prize for the discovery. Well, cl well, cl clearly, the, the, clearly they they should, or uh, but it's it's I, I think it's going to be even more difficult for the Nobel Committee to 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 allocate the credit when it comes to an organisation like like CERN uh, more difficult than it it was for them to decide which theorists to award the prize to. I should remind you that um, although only two of us have shared this prize, uh, Francois Anglais of, of Brussels and myself, that the work in 1964 uh, in, involved three groups of people, two, two in Brussels. Unfortunately, Robert Brote 
uh, uh, died a few years ago, so is no longer able to be awarded the prize, but he would certainly have been w one of the winners if he'd still been alive. But there were three, three others who also contributed, and uh, it is already uh, difficult to allocate the credit amongst the theorists, uh, although people seem to, a lot of people seem to think that, that I, I did all this single-handed. It was actually part of a, th a theoretical program which had been started in 1960, and the, the man who, who really initiated it uh, it was Yorukiro Nambu, fr uh, originally from Japan, who is now back in Japan, and he was awarded a share of a prize in 2008. So it's part of a, of a story which goes back at least to 1960, and, and 1964 was just a, 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 what turned out to be a rather successful episode in that story. Uh, can I... Can I add to that? I think that um, other organizations don't have the same rules, and Peter will be receiving an award from the Prince of Asturias Foundation in October, that's uh, from the Spanish royal family, and CERN is sharing that with Peter and Francois Anglais. So CERN is being recognized, and that prize will be uh, accepted for CERN on behalf by, by the Director General. So there have been occasions when CERN have been rewarded. It's just that the Nobel Committee's rules don't allow it. So here, there's a question here first. Gillian Bowditch from the Sunday Times. Um, given that very generous uh, answer, uh, Professor Higgs, should the Higgs boson be renamed to um, incorporate perhaps Professor uh, Ongley? And, and also my second question is, um, what are the practical applications of the discovery of the Higgs boson? I mean, what is possible now that wasn't possible before? Uh, well, uh, on the question of, of, of names, I, 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 th I think uh, re renaming it is, I mean, it may end up just being identified by, by a Greek letter or something of that sort. Um, the, uh, the, the attention has, has been mostly on this particle because discovering it was, was really vital to checking that the, the whole theoretical structure was, 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 was co correct. Um, but really, the, the, I think the important uh, br breakthrough in, in 1964 by that, the group of, group of theorists was what is now being called the Braut Anglia Higgs mechanism, which is the way in which uh, mass is generated for the particles which carry the weak force between elementary particles. And th that which originally, uh, by, as a result of su some accidents, had my name at attached to it, rather un unfairly, is, is generally, I think, referred to as the, the Braut Anglais Higgs mechanism. When it comes to the particle, the problem is, is that the, the, the were, uh, there, was, there was a much more explicit reference to it in, in a paper which I wrote. Somewhat ironically, the reference to it was put in in a second version because the first version of the paper had been rejected. So it's rather accidental that my name is attached to the particle, but I, I perhaps, simply because I drew attention to it, have a stronger connection than, than the others. So, I, I, I mean, getting rid of the name Higgs boson will probably be difficult. As for the second question, the practical applications, well, you can't really, really use this thing for much because it, 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 it lasts an extremely short time. When it's said to be discovered at CERN, what is discovered is in fact the, the, the tracks which result from what it, what it decays into in a very short time. So it's not the sort of thing that you can, you can easily make a beam of and, uh, and use for bombarding tumors or something of that sort. Uh, and the, the consequence of the discovery is much more in terms of, of, of what is beyond 
the present generation of experiments in CERN, the thing, kind of things which will be done when the machine starts up again in two years' time. And the hope and expectation is that, that the, the further discoveries t for which the uh, so-called Higgs boson gives maybe so, possibly some hints uh, will um, give us more insights into a relation of particle physics and cosmology, the early, early universe, the problem of dark matter, and so on. Now, that, of course, is still a very pure science, so it's not so, something that, uh, you know, you can go out and do things w with, but on the other hand, that CERN's record shows that this kind of activity solves, involves the solving of problems in building machines and running them and uh, analysis with computers and so on and so forth, which then has a very practical impact on the world we live in. So there's a next question here. Hey, Ishiguro of the Japanese newspaper Yomiuri Shinbun. Uh, Dr. Higgs, just you uh, mentioned about uh, Dr. Uh, Yoichiro Nambu. Uh, we know that uh, uh, Dr. Nambu was a peer reviewer of your thesis in 1964. Uh, what uh, personal advice did you get from him, if there are any, and what kind of particular influence uh, Dr. Nambu had upon you? And the second question is relating to the experiments in CERN. Uh, many Japanese manufacturers contributed a lot in uh, uh, making uh, very advanced uh, equipment, like uh, a superconductive cable from Furukawa Electronic and the photo uh, 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 multi-layer tubes from Hamamatsu uh, Photonics. What do you think of this contribution from Japanese manufacturers? Thank you. Okay, so the first question was what specific advice Nambu gave you about your 1964 paper and uh, his other influence on you? Well, first, first of all, um, the, the influence of, of Nambu was, was a very powerful one on, on me because when I was appointed to a lectureship in Edinburgh in uh, 1960, I'd, I'd rather lost my way in terms of, of the research I was doing, and I was l looking around for uh, some interesting uh, part of particle physics to, to work on, and it was Nambu's papers, uh, uh, well, the short paper was in 1960 in, in Physical Review Letters, and then a longer paper uh, with a, a collaborator in 1961. It was, it was those papers which aroused my, my interest in, in this kind of, of theory. But basically, what Nambu had done was to to learn a, a lesson from uh, the way that s certain systems in solid state physics, condensed matter systems, can, can behave, and say, well, maybe uh, this, this w kind of theory would, would work in particle physics too. Uh, uh, most people at the time did, didn't really uh, believe that, but I, f I found that, you know, very much, uh, uh, that was very insp inspiring, so I, f I followed in his footsteps, and w um, what I and others did in 1964 was essentially to supply uh, a missing component of the kind of theory which, which N Nambu ha had initiated it wasn't until three years later that the right application in, in particle physics was identified that it was a, a way to uh, solve the problems of the weak force amongst particles because everybody before that from Nambu onwards uh, was fascinated with, with symmetry breaking in strong interactions of particles and that was the wrong place for the application. But Nambu was certainly my inspiration, as he was, I think, for also for uh, Braut and Angler and, and the others. And when it came to my own paper in 1964, which was first rejected by uh, the physics letters, the European Journal, and then with uh, revision accepted by physical review letters, 
Uh, it wasn't for many years that I discovered who the referee was. I didn't meet Nambu until 1984. Um, uh, uh, so what did I learn from him uh, in that period? Well, from the, from the referee's comments as an anonymous referee, uh, I learnt for the first time that other people had, had discovered this mass-generating mechanism before me. Broughton Anglais published first and uh, Nambu uh, refereed their paper. Their paper was published on the day that mine arrived at the Physical Review Letters office. So then, in 1984, I met Nambu at a conference in the United States, and he identified himself as having been the referee. And again, I, I, I learned some things from him. I think I got the impression from him that uh, he, he was close to doing the same thing that the six of us did in various ways in 1964, uh, but he had a, had a, a setback in terms of an illness in his family which slowed him down, so he, he, he didn't complete his own program. We did, the, the six of us did it. And the other thing that I, I learned from him was that the, <laughs> the thing which became known as the Higgs boson was already uh, known experimentally had had actually been observed as a actually as a classical oscillation in a superconductor, and the superconductor is the system from which the inspiration for the theory through Nambu came. So I, I owe a lot to Nambu in various ways. So there was a second part to the question. Oh, the second which part was, uh, about, about the. Uh, contribution to the technology at CERN for superconducting cables and photomultipliers from, from Japan? Well, clear, well clear, clearly, without uh, superconducting cables and things of that sort, the, the, the machine wouldn't just w wouldn't, wouldn't be possible. So that's uh, very extremely important. I mean, from my, my experience visiting CERN, I, I've become aware, uh, well, not just of, of Japan's contribution, but but uh, I've been become aware of the, the, the great number of countries which have contributed to the components of that machine. You, you go round and you look at the, the origins of components in, in the tunnel and you, def you find this one came from the United States, the next one came from the Soviet Union and so on. It's, it's a very large number of of countries which contributed to, to the building of the machine. Okay, so there's a question here. Oh, sorry, okay. Sorry. Well, sorry. you've got the mic, um, but do you and then... The next. Okay, okay. Um, Professor Higgs, Debbie Edward from ITN. Many congratulations on your award. Um, this has been 50 years of very hard work after two initial papers being rejected. Can you describe to us what those 50 years have been like, the toll it's taken on you, and what it's taken, what you've had to give up to ensure that you did reach this point? Well, I, I think I should, uh, should uh, emphasize that um, um, my, my, my personal contribution to this kind of theory uh, essentially ceased in 1967 when Steven Weinberg and Abdus Salam found the right way to use the theory. They, uh, Stephen Weinberg in particular, uh, realized that we were all looking at the wrong sort of aspect of particle physics, and that, that it, it should be used in weak interactions, and that theory is, is the theory uh, which has, over the years, been verified. So uh, at that point, you know, there were those of us who, who worked in 64 had, as it were, missed the point in terms of what to do with the, the kind of theory we were formulating. Um, so uh, as for the, well, the wear and tear as a result of, of the work of 50 years, I didn't do it. Uh, it was uh, the, uh, it, it, it passed to to other people, and I, I did not contribute. And I, I have certainly made no contribution to the 
uh, program which led up to the uh, verification at, at CERN. That, that all began around the mid-70s when the previous machine called LEP was being planned there and the, the pay, pay person who was most responsible for drawing attention to the particle which bears my name was uh, John Ellis of CERN in collaboration with uh, Mary K. Gaillard and Dimitri Nanopoulos, uh, but it wasn't, it, it, it was no longer my contribution, so I, I'm, as it were, I'm scar-free <laughs> as far as that later period is concerned. Okay, so I will come to you, but the, uh, that, this lady first, please. Hello, Professor, it's Laura Bicker from BBC News. Um, I'd like to ask you where your love of physics originated, and I'd also like to ask your former student what it was like to be taught by Professor Higgs. <laughs> First one was, where did your love of physics come from? Well, I suppose I should go back to my, 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 my school days uh, during wartime <laughs> in Bristol. Uh, my father was a, 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 an engineer who, who worked for the BBC. Uh, I, I learned quite a lot about physics and mathematics from his student textbooks before I, I met the same things in, in school. Uh, in school in Bristol, uh, in those days, I wasn't, wasn't very inspired by the, the, the physics that was taught in, in those days. Uh, I, was, I, I found chemistry much more fun, uh, and uh, I clearly had some mathematical ability. Um, my interest in, well, well, my interest in chemistry, which is one level of the structure of ma matter, de developed further, partly, I suppose, as a result of becoming aware that there was at my school, which is called Cotton School in Bristol, there had been a rather distinguished former pupil, Paul Dirac, uh, about a quarter of a century before me. Uh, and it, uh, it was probably a curiosity about what, what, what it was that Paul Dirac had actually done, which, uh, which initiated my interest in structure of matter at the deeper level of what we now call particle physics. By the time I finished school uh, there in 1946, uh, the, the, there had been a, 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 a little uh, incident or two, un, unfortunately, at the end of the war in Japan, the, nucle, nucle, the two nuclear bombs, and uh, I went to two, to, I went to lectures at, public lectures at the University of Bristol by the two professors of physics, Neville Mott, and Cecil Powell about the background of that uh, nuclear physics bomb work. Uh, those lectures were a great success with the public, and Cecil Powell, who was a particle physics experimentalist, was inspired to give some public lectures on his own work. And I learned about the state of particle physics research in experiment in 1946 by attending Cecil Powell's lectures. And that set me off in this direction. So, Victoria, uh, a teaching assessment yeah. on uh, <laughs> Professor Higgs. I <laughs> so, uh, I took two lecture courses with Peter Higgs. This was 95, 96, I think it was just before you retired. I think it was the last year the last you were year. the last year of teaching. And I have to admit, they were tough. They were tough <laughs> lectures. But then Peter was teaching, you know, the very most advanced material that we're doing. But they were all so inspirational. And there, there's one particular moment I remember quite well in groups and symmetries. So you were talking about it's, it's a particular kind of symmetry that's very important in particle physics. It's got a, a name called SU3. But it's very hard to imagine in, in three dimensions in the world we live in. And I can't quite remember the words that Peter used at that point, but he made... He said something that made me finally understand what this symmetry was actually like. And so they were, they were tough lectures. I, I do remember the, 
possibly not the best marks I got, <laughs> but, um, but they were also inspirational. And I, I think the fact that Peter taught me um, has you know, helped following the, you know, what I do now, which is doing Higgs boson physics. I think it's inspired me. Okay, so at last, back to you. I'm sorry, so it's something Corell again at The Guardian. Can I ask two questions, one relatively serious and one relatively trivial? Can I ask Sir Timothy first, is um, Professor Higgs the first uh, Nobel laureate who actually did the work that led to the Nobel Prize at the university? So we know you, the university is associated with 18 laureates, but is he the first the university's had who did the work here? That's the first question. The second question is for Professor Higgs. What did you actually have for lunch in Leith? I would really have to do the proper background research on the other 17. Uh, I, yeah. I, I, I think Peter can help uh, you. I, I, I can answer that question because uh, before I came here this morning, I, I, I went into a, a cupboard where, at home closet where, where I have a, a, a list of uh, the Nobel laureates in chemistry and physics uh, up to about 19... 60, no, no, I think 1980 or something like that. And um, uh, the, the answer to the question is I think I am, I am the first uh, Edinburgh Nobel Laureate in Physics who, who did the work while working here. The pre there were two previous no Nobel Laureates in Physics from Edinburgh. There was Barclay in 1917 and there was Max Born in 1954, uh, they're both described as being from Edinburgh. Max Bourne, I know as a matter of fact, had retired and got gone to, back to live in Germany uh, by then because he retired in 1953, and the work he, he was given the prize for was done in Göttingen in the 1920s. It was part of the foundations of quantum mechanics. And Barclay, I'm not so sure about, but I think that by the time he was a uh, professor in Edinburgh, he'd already done the, the, the work for which he got the prize. So I think I'm the first who actually did the work here. Uh, and he was uh, interested in your, what you had for lunch on Tuesday. <laughs> oh, what did I have for lunch on Tuesday? Um, well, I, I had lunch at a place down in Le Leith, which, which, which uh, has a rather remarkable range of good beers. So the liquid <laughs> side was, was a, a rather, rather good uh, draft beer. Um, the, the, and I had a, a bowl of soup and a main course, which involved uh, sea trout. Uh, they did, it's a place where they have both good beers and good good cooking. <laughs> Once again, I mean, we're not seeking uh, to do product endorse. placement or endorse uh, commercial organisations here. So there's a question here first. Yeah. Uh, Professor Higgs, Rob Flett, BBC. Uh, we've heard a lot about how you've come to arrive at the Nobel Prize and about your, your um, fear of what's to follow in the next few months with all the attention it's going to bring, but it does give you a tremendous platform, even bigger than the one you've had so far. We've heard about the plans to build the Higgs Centre as, as part of the legacy. What do you hope that you're going to use this prize for as, as your personal legacy for the future? Uh, I, I haven't yet come to terms with, 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 with what, what I shall actually use the prize for. That's that that still has to be has to be sorted out. I'm com coming coming to terms with it gradually. <laughs> okay, and I think there's a question here. You're obviously at the very pinnacle of um, of British science, um, but we've had a report out this week suggesting that in England and Wales. Um, students coming out of school are at the, at the lower end of the 34 developed nations in terms of literacy and numeracy, particularly numeracy. What is your feeling about um, the quality of students coming into universities in the sciences these days? I mean, are, are we going to have the next generation of Nobel winners in Britain? Uh, that, uh, that I find difficult to answer because uh, I, I've been I, I, I've been retired now for um, what is it, 17 years, and um, during the, the, those 17 years, uh, you know, the, the educational systems, 
have, have been evolving in various ways. Uh, before I retired, I was already aware, as everybody was, I think, in university physics departments, that, that, that there were, I think there were, go, there were prob problems about the relation between what, what was taught in, in schools in preparation for university courses in, in these sciences and what the universities did. And that's, I, I mean, that's just a, an ongoing problem over many, many years. Uh, I, I don't know of any evidence that, 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 uh, that there's a, you know, any, any kind of decline in, 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 in a sort of intrinsic qual quality of, of students coming in, but, 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 the, but there have for many years been problems about, about the, the, the relation of, of, of the school teaching to the, the, the teaching in the university, and I don't really have a, a you know, up-to-date view on that. So, so we are hoping, of course, that the interest and excitement that has been generated uh, through this story, which has run for, for a long time, will inspire uh, more young people uh, to think about uh, an education in physics and mathematics uh, and to go on and apply those skills because those skills uh, we know are in uh, big demand uh, by industry, by commerce, uh, and our graduates go off and do a very wide range of jobs uh, and are often very uh, innovative in applying their, their mathematical and, and, and problem-solving skills that they've acquired while trying to, to understand things like uh, the Higgs boson. So uh, I think the posit really positive side of this message is that, you know, the, that we really do hope, uh, because the country is going to need uh, more and more of these people with these sorts of skills, that this whole episode uh, will inspire the brightest young people uh, to, to follow that career path. Uh, can, I add Sorry. can I add something? That Peter has been very generous in allowing his name to be associated with things that may well be inspirational. And on Tuesday, the Institute of Physics in Scotland launched a competition, a Peter Higgs competition, aimed at late primary and uh, secondary schools in order for them to be inspired by this. And I think the name of the first competition is what's after the Higgs, or something to that extent. So in, in a sense, Peter's already helping with that. Okay, so next question's there. Mike, Mike, I'll, Mike, I'll, I'll come to you in a moment. But for the time. A rather flippant one, Professor Higgs, if I may. If you hadn't been a scientist, is there some other walk of life, perhaps, that you might have worked in? Like perhaps a brewer or something? <laughs> if you hadn't been a physicist, what might you have been? Um, if I hadn't been a physicist, well, first of all, um, I, I suppose uh, I, I might more, in, well, more obviously in terms of my skills in my school days, become a mathematician uh, because not only did I find the uh, physics which was taught in my school days not very inspiring, but I, I, I didn't perform, perform, perform particularly well in it, so I, I got prizes at, at school for uh, languages and for math well languages including English uh, <coughs> uh, and mathematics and chemistry never for physics my first prize for physics came from the Royal Society uh, in 1981 uh, so th th the more obvious th th thing for me to do in terms of you know, uh, how I performed in school would have been to go into mathematics. But by that time, my interest in uh, the areas of physics that I eventually worked in had become so strong that I, I, I decided I must take a degree in physics uh, because the mathematics, for the most part, would look after itself. But if I did a mathematics degree, I would never acquire the uh, necessary know-how about the physics to do what I wanted to do. So that's part of the answer. The, the other thing to say is that, uh, I mean, if, if I were uh, being inspired to work in, in, in science of some sort, 
uh, as a, a school student in, in the present day, I would, would, I think, take much more, pay much more attention to biology. I didn't have any biology in school, and the whole subject was a mystery to me. But while I was doing my PhD in King's College London, uh, the structure of, of DNA was was elucidated, and the scene changed dramatically. And for me, uh, bio biological sciences became possible to understand in a way that I hadn't be hadn't believed it it could be before. So, I, I, so I, 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 that, that's an area w which would be, you know, I would seriously consider if I were a young student now. So we have 10 more minutes. Uh, and so if, in particular, if anyone who uh, has wanted to ask a question and has not been able to, can you sort of make yourself known? Uh, and I'll take the next question here. Professor, Professor Higgs, after everything that's happened to you in the last 50 years, what one piece of advice would you give to the young students of today? Uh, what advice would you give to young students today? Uh, well, uh, I'm, I'm not quite sure how broad that question is. I mean, if, if um, I mean, if I if I interpret it narrow that question narrowly as advice to students going in the same direction that I went, I, I, I think and this this I think goes back to our previous discussion about whether how students are prepared in school for what they meet in universities. I, I would want to warn students going into theoretical physics that being inspired by what is, you know, great, great things in the past is not enough. Uh, you have to work hard at the techniques involved, and in particular mathematical t techniques, this is something which in the past has, has not always you know, worked out very well between you know, physics and mathematics. And you know, even with the advent of our present advanced computers, you can't do every, every, everything without, uh, uh, without effort or just using computers. You still have to have some so some basic basic math mathematical skills. Uh, so, uh, just being inspired, but by the, the you know the lure of, of 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 physics is not enough. I'm, I'm interested as well. Sorry, Professor, in your broad advice though, because the lesson of your story perhaps is perseverance. What, what, what would your broad advice be to students of today? My. To, this is to students in to, to students, but what, more broadly than those that are pursuing just the physics or uh, looking to become uh, physicists. Um, well, well, I mean, the ob obvious thing, given the uh, situation with relate, in, in relation to future employment and so on, is to get a training which is sufficiently broad for you to be able to change direction when needed. That's uh, something which has you know, not always been done in the past. There have certainly been in the past uh, 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 routes you know, through universities which are, which are too specialized and, and where you, it isn't easy to change direction. But th that, I think, is vitally important in the present present sort of society we live in. So, Professor Higgs, there. can I ask you that question that we've just heard um, Alan Walker um, propose? Um, what's next after higgs Boson um, on, on a physics level and also for you personally, what's next? Well, in, uh, I mean, in, in terms of, of the, uh, you know, the, the, well, the narrow answer in terms of of, of, of particle physics is, I think, uh, what, what I mentioned before, that the, 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 um, the, the machine at Geneva, which is not, not 
designed just to discover the Higgs, Higgs boson, although some, sometimes you get that impression. That was just the first phase, uh, is expected to go on and uh, improve our understanding of, of the links between particle physics and what happened in the early universe, cosmological ma matters. That's, that's one thing. But of course, there's much, much more physics than just particle physics. So um, I mean, it's hard to be, hard to be a, a prophet about all, all the other kinds of, of, of physics which, which people are, are looking at. There have been all sorts of other exciting discoveries in, in recent years which don't have much to do with particle physics. Uh, the other part of the question was what's next for you personally? What's next for me personally? Well, uh, 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 obviously, I have, uh, I have to start thinking about a trip to Stockholm. <laughs> <laughs> I, I would have said lunch. <laughs> uh, so uh, I think this has to be the last question, uh, preferably if somebody has not yet had an opportunity to ask a question. Uh, are you e exhausted? Okay. Good. In that case, uh, I'll draw this uh, press conference to a close. Thank you ever so much, all of you, uh, for coming along. Uh, goodbye from us. This production is brought to you by the University of Edinburgh.